Good evening, everyone. Good evening, and welcome to the Nixon Library. My name is JoLynn Mahoney, and it's my pleasure to welcome all of you to the Richard Nixon Presidential Library and Museum tonight. Here, from the former, we're here for the former Second Lady of the United States, one of America's most admired women, and my good friend, Karen Pence. My husband, Pat, and I are proud members of the Richard Nixon Foundation at the President's family level. On behalf of the Nixon Foundation, I want to thank all the Foundation members in attendance tonight. Our featured speaker, Karen Pence, is the former Second Lady of the United States and former First Lady of Indiana. She is a mother, a grandmother, a watercolor artist, and a dedicated 30 years in the classroom as an elementary school teacher. As our second lady, Karen was committed to raising awareness of the importance of art therapy and launched a nationwide campaign to elevate and encourage the nation's military spouses. Karen and Mike Pence have been married since 1985 and are the proud parents of three adult children and proud grandparents of their three granddaughters. Their daughter, Charlotte, who is an author herself, is joining us here tonight as well, as well as her little daughter, a month old daughter, Etta. Just last week, Karen published her first book, which you all have in your hands tonight, When It's Your Turn to Serve, Experiencing God's Grace and His Calling for Your Life. In this book, Karen tells heartwarming stories of her extraordinary journey in serving the American people and the people of Indiana. Not only will you enjoy reading Karen's warm and deeply personal stories in these 220 pages, but you will also love seeing the two dozen illustrations Karen has featured in this book. Tonight, Karen will take a few questions from the audience, so if you'd like to ask a question, please write it down on uh, a note card and give it to the docent, and your question will be read. So now, please join me giving a warm welcome to the former Second Lady of the United States, my husband and I's good friend, Karen Pence. Thank you, JoLynn and Pat. Uh, thank you to the Nixon Foundation. This is quite an honor to be here tonight and, and quite a milestone for me. Um, you know, this book, I was telling a group earlier, is meant to be an encouragement uh, to the reader. It's meant to encourage you to serve wherever God might be calling you. Let me tell you a story about how God used me in a mighty way and how he gently and patiently showed me how to wear the mantle that he was placing on my shoulders. Walk with me on part of the journey that I traveled and the investments that I made for him. As a child, I loved to memorize poetry. My favorite poet of all time is Robert Frost. And when I was in the fifth grade, Robert Frost's daughter, Leslie, visited the school that I attended, and she heard that I liked to memorize poetry. So after her presentation, she gave me a collection of Robert Frost poems, and she inscribed it for Karen, because you memorize poetry. I cherish that gift, and I want to share with you one of Robert Frost's poems that I'm sure you know but it's important to the rest of the story. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and sorry I could not travel both, and be one traveler. Long I stood and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth. Then took the other 
as just as fair and having perhaps the better claim because it was grassy and wanted wear. Though as for that, the passing there had worn them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay in leaves no step had trodden black. Oh, I kept the first for another day. Yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh, somewhere ages and ages hence, two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. I see my life as a blessing, but there have been struggles in my life. You know, the life of a political wife is not as glamorous as you might think. <laughs> um, there have been times when I, like perhaps you, have simply had to call up a friend and vent. Times where I got on my knees as the song, The Warrior is a Child, by Twyla Paris describes, I drop my sword and cry for just a while because deep inside this armor, the warrior is a child. Throughout my childhood and early adult years, as I would experience the struggles that we all go through, my faith grew deeper and deeper for me, the Lord was the one who was constant. And through it all, I've tried to take the road less traveled and head the way that might seem uncertain, especially if I feel that it is where God is ultimately calling me to serve him and others. And no matter what, he has always gotten me through and never abandoned me. I want this book to be a hope-filled book for you. I know it was a disappointing day for all of us on Capitol Hill today, and it seems like our country is just in a state of chaos. But I want this book to be an inspiration to you and show you some of the great things that are going on. I learned the truth in my experiences behind the Psalm 19. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. As First Lady of Indiana, I became familiar with the plight of the honeybee. I started a hive at the governor's residence, and then another hive at the vice president's residence four years later. And believe me, it created quite a buzz. <laughs> and over the past 10 years, I have learned so much from the bees. I've seen that God created them with a very specific purpose. He gave them all of the tools that they needed to fulfill their purpose. Did you know that the honeybee, in their short six to eight week lifespan, travels the distance equal to one and a half times around the planet Earth. And that in that tiny lifespan, each honeybee creates only one twelfth of a teaspoon of honey. I was standing alongside a beekeeper in Montana once, and I was watching all of the bees come in because sometimes what my team would do as we traveled with Mike, we would take a little short excursion wherever we were in the world and we would visit bees and we got to see beehives all over the world and we also got to taste the honey. <laughs> that was the best part. But this beekeeper in Montana said to me, Mrs. Pence, I can tell you which bees are coming back to the hive as opposed to the ones who are heading out. And I didn't believe him. But as second lady, I have to keep my poise and composure. And I said, okay, I'll bite. How do you know which bees are coming to the hive or leaving? And he said, if you look closely, 
the bees that are coming back to the hive are flying low to the ground because their pollen sacs on their legs are filled with pollen. And if you look closely, you can see the little yellow on their legs and they're the ones that are low to the ground. And sure enough, I could see that. I thought of that conversation many times in the future as I reflected on my own experiences. What would I be bringing back to my hive? What lessons would I share? Having ventured far and wide like the bees in the roles in which God had placed me, I wanted to take what I had learned and apply it to my own life and help people along the way. And as I wrote the book, I decided to put a little B fact at the beginning of every chapter that goes along with what we talk about in that chapter. For example, the chapter about secret service talks about guard bees. The chapter about how all three of our kids got married between the election in 2016 and the election in 2020 talks about how when a hive gets too big, the queen will leave and she will take a swarm with her. The bees work isn't quick or easy. They don't immediately see the fruit of their labor. They travel far and wide and work diligently. And like the bees journey, mine was going to require diligence and patience and trust. And I would end up traveling quite far and wide too. Since then, the bees have been a constant in my life teaching me not only about myself, but about God's creation and his plan for me. Whenever life takes an unexpected turn, I've thought about the bees, and I've thought if God can give this little tiny honeybee what it needs for its purpose, surely he can do the same for me. And this morning on the 11th floor of my hotel, I looked at the window and there was a little honeybee right on the glass, <laughs> encouraging me to come tonight. In my book, I tell so many stories that I hope you enjoy, but I tell one story about how Mike and I lost our first and second campaigns for Congress. We had to let that dream go and we decided to continue with our lives. Several years went by and we were content. After many struggles trying to start our own family, we now had three small kids. We had just built our dream home. I had started my watercolor business. Mike had his own statewide call-in talk radio show. We were in a good place as a family. Our youngest was heading to kindergarten. But then, <laughs> The congressional seat that we had run for twice before and lost became open. Now we felt like we needed to at least consider running again. Could God really be calling us to this again? This is not what we had anticipated. Life was comfortable and we had let that dream go. But perhaps this is why God was bringing this back into our lives again because now it wasn't our idea and our ambition leading us. It was more a sense of service and calling. Believe me, God knew what he was doing when he didn't let us win before. We really thought we were God's gift to Washington, D.C., and we would not have been effective if we had won then. You know, I consider myself a risk taker by nature. I used to have a motorcycle before I met Mike. I got my pilot's license in my early 20s. I've gone skydiving and loved it. I like to rise to the challenge, whatever it might be. But I had some real concerns when faced with this big change in our family's life. It was different this time than it had been before. There was a lot to consider. For Mike's 40th birthday, 
I had saved all of my watercolor earnings, and I surprised him with a family trip to a dude ranch in Colorado because he loves to ride horses. And one afternoon, near the end of our stay at the ranch, Mike and I took a ride by ourselves up to the top of a bluff in the Teddy Roosevelt National Forest. The whole week, we had been struggling with this decision. Should we run for Congress again? We had been thinking and praying and talking, and we got off of our horses, and we sat on the side of that ledge, and Mike said, Karen, we've, we've got to make a decision. I mean, time is running out. Well, we had been to this rodeo before, pun intended. We understood the demands of campaigning and the additional demands of raising the funds necessary, the time commitment, the personal financial sacrifices. We had weighed the pros and cons, discussed it at length, prayed extensively, but he was right. It was time. Well, Mike is a romantic at heart. You might not know that about him. And as we were sitting on that ledge, we looked out and we saw two red-tailed hawks just rising on the wind's current. And it was lifting them higher and higher. And Mike said, do you see those two red-tailed hawks? Those are like us. And I said, well, if those hawks are like us, then I think we should run. But this time, we should run like the hawks. We should step off of this cliff and make ourselves available to God. And this time, instead of ambition driving us, we should allow God to lift us up to wherever he wants us to serve with no flapping. And right then and there, in the Teddy Roosevelt National Forest, we made the decision. And no flapping has been our mantra ever since. And every new staff member hears this story. They understand this is our approach to decision making. We want to be open to God's calling and his leading in our lives. And we don't want to be forcing our own wills into the equation. And somehow, and maybe you've experienced this as well. Somehow, when we have had to make these monumental decisions, it's his peace that always seems to, to confirm our choices and we're ready to move forward. Honeybees use the sun as a directional device when departing and coming back to the hive. And I use God's word. For 12 years, we served our country in the United States Congress. I taught elementary art during those years, and we did our best to raise our kids. We then felt called to come home to Indiana to run for governor. And then, as we all know, we were called to be vice president and second lady of the United States. But my desire in all of these roles was to be a good steward of the position in which God was placing me to use this moment in time. I hope you enjoy the chapter about being first lady of Indiana because in that chapter, I talk about starting the Indiana First Ladies Charitable Foundation. And that charity, gave we gave over $600,000 to charities in all 92 counties, benefiting families and children. I tell of my initiatives as second lady, as you heard Joe Lynn say, art therapy, improving the lives of our military spouses, my role as ambassador of prevents, the president's roadmap to empower veterans to end the national tragedy of suicide. I talk about Special Olympics and, of course, the bees. When I tell about the Second Olympics stories, I hope you enjoy that because I say in that section, this was the highlight of being second lady. And not only did the publisher question me on that, but then the editor questioned me on that. Oh, no, no, I don't think Mrs. Pence meant to say that. I think she meant to say that was a highlight, but it was the highlight. 
And when you read that chapter, you will see why. It was the most wonderful experience of my life going to the winter and summer games for Special Olympics. These were certainly important initiatives, but my roles as mom, wife, friend, teacher were equally important. While we're no longer in office, we have immersed ourselves once again where God is calling us, whether that's helping our kids or grandchildren, visiting refugees crossing the border from Ukraine into Poland, or spending quality time with veterans and their spouses in marriage retreats with Samaritan's Purse in Alaska. Or believe it or not, <laughs> considering returning to public life. And as we made that decision, and I was weighing it out, Charlotte said to me, Mom, read your book. <laughs> she was right. We've served Thanksgiving meals in Florida to those who suffered from Hurricane Ian. And we've also made an effort, now that we have a home again, to just be good neighbors and enjoy ice cream socials and barbecues with new friends and old. I can rest in the fact that when it was my turn, I answered his call. I stepped off of that cliff and trusted him to carry me, to lift me up to where he wanted me to serve. And he did, and he will continue to do so, just like he will with you, because now it's your turn. After the honey is harvested, the bees do not stop. They do not quit. They start again, making more honey, raising more worker bees, and continuing with their purpose. Thank you so much for having me tonight. Thank you. Oh, you guys. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you, Mrs. Spence. And I know uh, some of the audience have submitted questions for the second lady, so I will start. Um, thank you. Uh, first question, what have you learned about discerning God's calling for your life and stewarding the talents he has given you? Okay, can you read it again? It kind of echoed. Sure. Uh, what have you learned about discerning God's calling for your life and stewarding the talents he has given you? Well, discerning his calling is tough. You know, that's a tough one. And I talk about that a lot in the book, and I, I explain, you know, those times always come with anxiety, you know? I mean, you're always like, should we buy this house? Am I supposed to go here for college? Do I take this job? Do I marry this person? I mean, and, and for us, it has been, you know, looking into his word and praying, asking others to pray, you know? There is wisdom in multiple counselors. And uh, that's what we found. So, but I, I will tell you that it's, it's after you make that decision that you, I feel you feel his peace. And sometimes, you know, Mike and I might say, okay, I think this is what we're supposed to do. Okay, let's sleep on it. Then we might wake up the next morning and say, you know, I just, I don't have any peace about that. I don't, that doesn't feel right to me. And, and so I, I think he does give us his peace. But I do wish that God would just send me an email sometime, you know. I want to be obedient. Just tell me what you want me to do, <laughs> you know? But he doesn't. He keeps me on my knees. This question is, I've noticed that you are a very good speaker. How long did it take you to master public speaking, or does it come natural to you? Well, that's a great question. You know, when Mike and I started dating, um, and thank you for the compliment, whoever that was, um, when Mike and I started dating, one thing we learned about each other was that in high school, we both had been on our school's speech team. So um, I've always loved giving speeches. So that part has never been uh, intimidating for me. And I think, you know, do we have any teachers in the room? Yeah. I mean, we're used to it. We, we get up in front of the classroom every day, and we can wing it. And, and so I think that was a lot of practice for me, 30 years of practice. <laughs> 
what can you tell us about the vice president's residence in Washington, D.C.? You know, it is a beautiful home. Uh, it is a Victorian home. And the vice president's residence is a very special place to visit because there are no tours. Um, because of the security complications, I think, of the nature of that home, you only can go to the vice president's residence if you're invited. And so we made a huge effort, and I, I actually, there's a whole chapter, a couple of chapters, I think, on the vice president's residence, because um, we wanted to use it uh, for anything we could. So we had military families come and do pool parties. Uh, each family likes to leave something improved and when they leave um, we redid the pool house with private money the quails had put in the pool when they were there and so we had military families come and i gotta tell you it is a humbling thing when you are at a pool party and a little child is on the phone facetiming their deployed parent i mean that is a tough moment and since then we've had our son and son-in-law deploy so now I've experienced that. Um, but I would say the vice president's residence is, um, it, it's, a, it's a very warm and welcoming place. It has a big wraparound front porch uh, on it. Um, but I talk a lot about, you know, the, some of the struggles of moving there because there was no furniture upstairs, you know. So we had like six weeks and uh, we had been living in the governor's residence. We didn't have very much of our own furniture that we had had for 30 years. We gave most of it away to staff or um, a couple of homeless shelters, and we didn't take it with us. And so we had six weeks <laughs> to furnish the upstairs. Now, the downstairs, the furniture pretty much stayed. But upstairs, you can imagine, if you're moving into a house, you don't want the person's furniture who lived there before you. You know, I didn't want the Biden's furniture, and I know Kamala didn't want our furniture. <laughs> and so, but you're like, oh my goodness, we, we've got like, what, I think it's like four bedrooms, and you're like, okay, what, we gotta furnish this. But I wasn't allowed to be in the house. I was, could only go in one time when Jill toured me. And so I'm trying to figure out, what, what do we need? Like, I don't even know what we need. But we had a decorator get with us. Again, private money purchased that furniture. And I just said, show me what's available in six weeks. And I'll just pick. And in one afternoon, furnish the whole thing. <laughs> it was crazy. What is your favorite book? Well, I'd have to say the Bible. It's my favorite book. But if we want to go beyond the book... The, or the Bible, I will tell you, um, I really loved as a kid, Harriet the Spy. And, and there's just something about that book that I just, it's just been endearing to me since I was a little girl. I think I liked Harriet spying on everybody. What was your favorite part of the daily or weekly routine of being the second lady? Well, when I was second lady, I actually taught art two days a week um, because I had taught art for 12 years at this Christian school. Their art teacher left and they called me and said, okay, this is a crazy idea, but can you fill in just for a month or two? And it turned out I stayed for three years. And the reason is because my staff was small and it took them a couple of days every week to get the week planned. So I told them, you spend Monday and Tuesday planning and we're out doing stuff the rest of the week. Um, and so that worked out very well. But I would say, you know, really, um, I don't know what, if, if you're talking about on a daily or weekly basis. I mean, I can tell you highlights like the Special Olympics. Uh, um, I don't know. I could tell you things I didn't like about it. <laughs> I just, I gotta tell you, I just took my staff all out to dinner. I did a book signing at Tyson's in Washington, D.C., their Barnes & Noble on Friday. 
and I invited my staff to come. And they all came. And I said, oh gosh, if you're all coming, I'm going to take you all to dinner beforehand. And I said, it means we have to have dinner at 4 o'clock. And yes, I have become a senior citizen since I left you all. <laughs> and I will tell you um, that they were, they're so much fun, but they drove me crazy. And I told them that. I said, you know what, you guys? I'm driving my own car now. I'm adjusting the thermostat. For some reason, they would not let me adjust the thermostat. Oh, no, Mrs. Pence. Oh, no, we'll get it. We'll get it. Sit down. You can't adjust the thermostat. I was like, are you crazy? Yes, I can. Um, and I brought up that story with them this week. I said, I'm doing very well adjusting my own thermostat. <laughs> Other than watercoloring and painting, what, are, what do you do to relieve stress or what other outlets would you recommend? Well, I love to read. Mike and I love to walk. Um, I think that's something that has helped our marriage through the years is either in the morning or the evening taking a walk and just, you know, reconnecting. Um, I like to swim. Uh, we like to ride bikes too. Uh, we rode bikes a lot when he was governor and vice president. What advice would you give to young staffers going to Washington, D.C.? What, what advice would I give a young staffer? Uh, you know, if you've ever seen The Wizard of Oz, I'd turn back if I were you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, first of all, um, it's so inspiring to us to see the next generation step up and want to serve. And that's what this book is about. And so um, it's wonderful to see you go. I would say that um, you need humility in Washington, D.C. You need discernment. You know, choose your friends carefully. Um, and uh, just don't ever forget what a great nation we serve. You know, Jason, the special exhibits curator, took us through the exhibit here on the POWs. And I saw near the end, it talked about how those POWs would take like little, you know, uh, juice or it was like the, the blood of mosquitoes and one of them on him, the wall of his cell made an American flag. You know, don't ever forget what a great nation we serve. It's kind of a mess right now, but the people are not a mess. The people in America are worth all of your sacrifice and, and serving our country. So I'm so grateful always when young people want to serve. What can you tell us about art therapy for someone who is interested in getting involved in it? Um, well, art therapy... So when I was, and I tell this in the book, the story about how I learned about art therapy, and I won't go into all the detail, but originally I learned about art therapy for children with cancer. And I was on the, you know, steering committee, later the board of Tracy's Kids. And it's a wonderful organization in Washington. And I, I was surprised to hear that these kids would say, Mom, when do I get to go back to the hospital? And I thought, wow, there's something to this. And I started learning more about art therapy. Art therapy is a discipline that requires the art, the client or patient, and the art therapist. It's not like therapeutic art, like when I get my watercolors out and turn on music. It's not that, although art can be therapeutic. It is actual therapy. So the art therapist directs the patient uh, to do something specific. And then the art therapist can, can draw out those feelings and, and then finish the session or finish the therapy. And when I was first lady of Indiana, I learned about art therapy as um, how it's used with... Um, veterans and I tell the story about combat paper and in combat paper a military member how many military members do we have here veterans 
Yeah, raise your hands up way, way, way high. Thank you um, for your service. But combat paper was fascinating for me to observe, and I started to learn that, oh, this can be used with all types of trauma uh, because the side of the brain injured during trauma is, is the verbal side. And so you can't talk about it. And our vets didn't know, why can't I talk about this trauma? Or why can't this child talk about having cancer? And the art just brings it out and heals that side of the brain. But combat paper is where a veteran will bring a uniform in. And, you know, that's been their identity for a long, long time. They've worn that same outfit every day. And when you have to start over, it's very difficult. And so they would bring their uniform and cut it into small pieces. And then they would put it through a pulp machine, which makes it into a very thick paper. It kind of rolls out this thick paper. And that used to be their uniform. And then on that paper, they can paint or do a stencil, if they're not comfortable painting, a new image. So it's like a new beginning for them. And the stories about art therapy, I, I can't even tell you. Every time I heard about art therapy, the stories were just fascinating. And I tell a lot of them in the book. And, you know, where these veterans would say, you know, I mean, these are, you know, tough guys. And you say, we'd like you to try art therapy. They are not interested. <laughs> it takes a long time to get them to come. And then they'll say, this saved my life. This saved my marriage. I tried everything else, but the art brought it all out. And then we could talk about it. Because I've had a lot of great questions here. Just a few more left. Uh, how did your relationship with God grow and struggle during your time serving as second lady? Hmm. Well, you know, I talk about a couple of things in the book. Um, one of the things that I believe in is prayer. And I believe in prayer support. And when I was a congressional spouse, I did a prayer email um, to supporters, and then they would pass it along. Um, like, for example, it today it might say something like, you know, please pray for the House of Representatives. And please pray for Kevin McCarthy. Please pray for leadership in, you know, something like that. Whatever the topic of the day was in Congress. Um, and then I have a couple of uh, prayer partners, a um, couple in uh, Virginia who we've been praying together every week for, uh, well, let's see, probably 22 years. And then I have a group that I started in Indiana when I was first lady, because you can't really go to a Bible study, you know, because everybody's like, oh, Karen Pence's prayer request was, you know, would Mike pick up his socks? You know, <laughs> something like that, that you're like, I don't, I can't be vulnerable. And so I started a group at the governor's residence, and we do ours by email. So we do a prayer email every single week. It's about six women. And so... I think for me, prayer is always what has kind of helped sustain me and, and then grow my faith. And I, I tell some fun little things that I've, I've done with prayer in the book, but I'm not giving out all the secrets. You're going to have to read it. <laughs> Are there any former first ladies or second ladies that you look up to? Well, I told a story beforehand about, you know, Barbara Bush, who, oh my gosh, I... I I just loved her. I just related to her when I didn't know her, you know? I mean, I was like, okay, she's, and I, I'm not trashing anyone else, but I personally related to the fact that she didn't care about being svelte, you know? <laughs> I was like, yes. Um, but she was very kind to me when I became second lady, and I'll share with you, half of you have already heard this story, but she sent me a note and she said, um, congratulations on being second lady. 
She said, when I was second lady, I got up every morning and I looked for something good to do. And the press never paid any attention. And when George became the nominee for president, I opened my mouth and my tongue started getting me in trouble and it's gotten me in trouble ever since. And it was just such an honest and open remark. Um, so I would say, really, she's been wonderful. Um, you know, Mike and I, you know, um, have, have had the privilege of having relationship with, with some of the former presidents and first ladies. I will tell you the, um, the, when I became first lady of Indiana, I sat down and I tell this story with all, and this is a good piece of advice for whatever you're going out to do. I sat down with all of them and said, tell me what I need to know. And, um, you know, two of them were Democrat and one was a Republican. And I have to tell you, like Susan Bai, who has passed away since, she took me to lunch and I took notes and notes and notes and notes. And it was so wonderful. That that's why this book is inspiring because, you know, there are wonderful people on both sides of the aisle and we get along just fine. Uh, in the real world. And um, I became a friend with Susan Bai. And so I would say that that uh, she was one that I looked up to. Um, and I mean, you all don't know all the former first ladies of Indiana, but uh, there's some pretty special ladies in that group. Okay, and this is our final question for the evening. And after we wrap up here, Mrs. Pencer is gonna be in the front entrance where she'll sign copies of your books. Um, I'm sure you talk about this in the book, uh, so you don't have to give it all away. But how did you feel when your husband was chosen as the vice presidential running mate? Well, it, I do tell that story because um, when he knew he was being considered, I tell the story about how I, I got kind of annoyed with him because my best friend was visiting from Montana. And that happens like once a year, and I get to see her for a day. And we had gone on a long walk and I walked back to the governor's residence and he pulled up and he was like, Karen, I've got to talk to you. And I was like, you know, how about later? I mean, you know, her, her name is Karen too. And I said, I mean, Karen's here, okay? I mean, like really, what could be that important? <laughs> and then he told me and I was like, oh, that's kind of important. Um, but, you know, I will tell you, and I, I think I told this in the book, when, the, President Trump invited us to um, Bedminster. Um, it was because when we knew we were being considered, um, Mike said, I can't really tell you whether or not I would even accept unless I get to know you a little better. And it's, you know, July and we're kind of out of time. So I, and I understand, but I would want to know your family better and I would want to know what you see the role as because you know some vice presidents are not very active and some are and the president immediately said we'd like you to come to bedminster this weekend charlotte actually went with us then and we had dinner with um the president and melania and at the <laughs> you can picture him saying this at the end of the dinner, he said, well, Mike, you know, this is going to work out just fine for you because, you know, we'll find a place for you. We'll find a place for you. So, you know, because we had to take our name off the ballot for running for reelection as governor. So we actually, to be um, the nominee, we would have to not, not be on the ballot to run for reelection. So there was a sacrifice in being considered. And he said, it, it's gonna work out just fine for you. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll find something for you. So Mike and I took our little golf cart back to the room we were staying in. And I said, it's not you. And he said, no, I don't think it's me either. And I said, I mean, maybe you'll get a place in the cabinet, you know? I mean, if he wins, but it, he made that very clear. He kind of let you down easy. And then it was kind of a surprise then. Because, you know, Mike didn't even endorse him in the Indiana primary. <laughs> and he, the president always liked to tell the story. You know, Mike, that was the nicest non-endorsement I got in the whole country. <laughs> Mrs. Pence, thank you for sharing with us tonight. We can't wait to read the book.
Thank you, everybody. Please give a warm thank you to Mrs. Pence. We'll see you next time.